So good evening. I am uh, not going to be the speaker tonight, uh, luckily. Uh, I'm just here to introduce my good friend Duarte, who's going to be giving us a talk about uh, SilaDB, which on which he's been working for a year. So he will, he will, I will, I will expect that we will, he will go deep into details. Okay. And I also wanted to uh, tell you about the the meetup for if anyone is is the first time who comes to this uh, meetup. Uh, this is a meetup uh, organized by Shift employees. Um, we are um, doing it around, we have frequency of around, once around every six weeks, usually here, but the locations uh, may vary. And we are open to external speakers such as uh, Duarte, and lucky to uh, have them. And uh, so if anyone is interested in uh, giving a talk about Anything related to the to the scope of the meetup, microservices, um, we are happy to take ideas. Uh, there is a hashtag here on the bottom of the slide. You are going to be, I, I suppose, uh, live tweeting the event uh, for the millions of people that are going to be uh, watching it. And uh, soon after, uh, in the following days, uh, we will post the video in uh, YouTube, where you can also see all the past videos, including uh, my last talk. And Galos. <laughs> um, that's it. I will leave it to Duarte. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, does anyone here use Cassandra or know about Cassandra? Okay. Cool. Has anyone ever heard about SiloDB before? Okay. Cool. So, um, this is going to be a high-level talk about low-level things. I'm going to start by introducing SiloDB. Um, talking a bit how the system behaves, then I'll zoom into a particular node, talk about some algorithms and implementation details, and finally come to a conclusion. So, SilDB is a database, a NoSQL database, compatible with uh, Apache Cassandra. It is compatible in that uh, you interact with SilDB the same way you interact with Cassandra, you use the same tools, they share the same uh, storage format, uh, it's very easy to migrate. Uh, SiloDB, however, distinguishes itself by being 10 times faster on the same hardware. Not only 10 times faster, but 10 times faster with lower latency. And not only that, it has about 100 less tunables than Cassandra. It, it is mostly self-tuning, self-tunable. Uh, and it is written in uh, C++. So here there's a, a benchmark comparing a three-node Scylla cluster against a bunch of Cassandra clusters. And you can see on the bottom graph that a three-node Scylla cluster is competitive with a 30-node Cassandra cluster. So they have about the same throughput. Um, on the bottom you have the loads that we're sending to the cluster and on the y-axis the load that the cluster is handling. Um, however, if you look at the top graph, you'll notice that um, it's a graph for the 99th percentile of latency, and you'll notice that it tells a different story. So Scylla has much lower latencies than Cassandra. This was all done on AWS on, on the same hardware. Sorry. Okay, so at the system level, both Scylla and Cassandra are very similar. They are both um, Dynamo-based systems, which means um, there is no master, there is no node that is special, any node can handle any request. A node that handles a request is called a coordinator, and it will contact as many re replicas as needed to complete the request. Um, you have you can control how many replicas um, given the table stores its data in, and per request you can specify the consistency level, which is how many replicas um, the coordinator needs to contact and get a response from before uh, considering the the request uh, successful. So, uh, in terms of the cap theorem, uh, both Scylla and Cassandra are AP systems which means they are available during a network partition. This in turn implies that um, you can get two replicas can be in a split, split brain situation where a replica has updates that the other replica doesn't have or that they have conflicting updates. 
And to solve this, um, we run a process called repair, which can happen during reads. So if you read from multiple replicas, you can uh, already repair some of them. If one doesn't have data, the other has. Or as a scheduled process um, that repairs data of a table. So as for the data model, it's, um, it's structured data. You, it's not just simply a key value store. And you can have a table where the columns have a particular type. Um, and the rows of that table are identified by a primary key. The primary key is composed of uh, one or more partition keys and one or more clustering keys. The partition key is what is used to select the node that uh, stars and handles that particular um, row, um, one or more nodes in, in case it's replicated. And the clustering key is what defines the ordering of the rows as they are laid out on, on disk. Um, so data is laid in disk as a set of SS tables. An SS table is a string sorted table. So every row in the SS table, um, all the rows in a given SS table will be sorted according to the clustering key. And data is written in a, in a single flush to a mem table, to a, an SS table. Each SS table is immutable. So it's something that you write once and never update. This means that um, when you have when you are updating a column of a given row, you have to write a new row in a, to a different SS table. And the same thing with deletes. When you do a delete, you don't actually remove any data from disk. What you do is you append a tombstone. So, and this is happening over time. So, you're filling the memory with updates. Then at some particular point, you have to flush them to disk and create an SS table. And while you are creating these SS tables, read performance starts to suffer because to answer a particular query, the system may have to um, load and walk every one of these tables. And as time goes on, as a background process, we'll actually take a set of tables and compact them. This is a very lightweight process. It's a chip because uh, the rows of the SS tables are sorted. So you just have to do, you just have to go over sequentially over each SS table and then merge the rows and write it to a new table. So at this point in time, if you have a read request, you, you, don't, have to, you don't have to read uh, the, the first five SS tables, you just have to read uh, these three SS tables. Um, Writing new SS tables is a foreground process, but compacting them happens in, in the background, uh, as it can. So, what um, originates a mem table, uh, an SS table, is a mem table, which is just an accumulation of writes in memory. Um, and in Cassandra, you have to configure um, the maximum size of the mem tables, that they can have before being flushed to disk. In Scylla, it's usually a percentage of memory, and we tune it uh, on the fly. Um, when you have a read, you have not only to take into account the SS tables, but uh, mem tables as well. However, if all you have is this, then you have a problem, which is if the node goes down before flushing a mem table to disk, then you might lose data. So to complete the picture, you have to add the commit log. A commit log is a file that's stored on disk to which you append an incoming write. And there is no sort order in this file, it's just um, a set of updates that you discard when a mem table is flushed to disk. Sorry. So, Scylla and Cassandra share these algorithms, and still, Scylla has much higher performance. And it's not enough to rewrite it in C++. You have to um, be very diligent about how you implement them. In particular, we have a set of guidelines. 
we want the implementation to be extremely efficient in that no CPU cycle is ever wasted. We want the implementation to utilize every resource of the machine. If the machine has multiple CPUs, it's going to use them all. It's going to use all the disk bandwidth and it's going to use all the network bandwidth. So, and, and finally, it's all about control. Control is key to achieving good latency. You want to be able to prioritize requests. You want to be able to uh, specify exactly on which those CPU cycles will be spent on. And that brings us to SysTarm, which is uh, kind of the first step of the, of the whole picture. It's a C++ library for high-performance uh, applications. And it has, it imposes a thread per core design. This means that at most there is one thread running per core. This means that that thread can never ever block because if it blocks, there's, there are no other threads to run on that CPU. And it means that we're not utilizing the CPU. So nothing ever blocks when you're building a CSR application. So the way we solve this is by making everything asynchronous. So every, everyone is used to doing asynchronous network programming. Right? No, nobody is going to call a microservice and synchronously and block the thread that's calling the service. This is because we realize that there is a lot of latency involved in making a network request. The request has to go to the remote host, it has to be serviced, and the reply has to come back. Right? So, we are used to doing asynchronous networking. But the same thing is true of both uh, file I.O. and even uh, multicore. Right? When you access an SSD, what you are doing is sending a request to the disk controller. And the request is going to sit on the disk SKUs, and then the disk controller is going to service them. In, in the old days, it would, had had to spin and find the correct sector and load them. And then it's going to send an interrupt to the kernel, who's finally going to process the, the I.O. completion. There's a lot of latency involved here. And the same thing is true of CPUs. So if two cores are connected by a last level cache, if you're reading data owned by another core, there's um, cache coherency overhead. And this is even worse if you have a NUMA node, a NUMA machine, where accessing memory that lives on a different CPU's NUMA node is very expensive. The request has to go over a QPI link. So there is a lot of latency involved here. And the way we, we deal with, uh, with this is by exposing asynchronous CPIs based on promises and features um, that allow you to uh, program all these things asynchronously. So um, features and promises, I guess, uh, everyone's heard about. It's used everywhere in Java, Scala, and um, JavaScript. Talk a little bit more about that later. And finally, uh, Sistar comes with some TCP IP uh, user mode stack. This is uh, because you can use the PDK with Sistar to totally bypass the kernel to process uh, network requests. So in SiloDB, we take advantage of this uh, thread per core design and use the same partition key that is used to shard data across different nodes to shard data over multiple CPUs inside a single node. And we shard using the same partition key, but different bits to avoid um, aliasing. So here we see the traditional uh, stack where you have uh, threads that are either, um, that can block. They can block because they're doing synchronous file I.O. or they can block because they're taking a lock to access some shared resource. And because the threads can lock, and block, uh, you need to have uh, more threads than cores if you want to keep a core busy at all times. This in turn implies a lot of scheduler over overhead, you have a lot of contact switches, you have to involve the scheduler in uh, deciding what thread to run next, and the scheduler may not always give the correct answer. Um, and it's, your data structures will need to be thread safe, of course, so it implies a much higher uh, overhead. In CSR, on, on the other hand, where you have a single thread assigned to a particular core, 
what we have is a task scheduler, where a task is a very lightweight um, data structure. It's usually a pointer to a lambda function. And what it usually does is uh, schedule some I.O. Either we do a file read, a file write, or a network uh, call. And what the task scheduler will do is basically run a reactor loop where it executes tasks and then processes I.O. completions. An I.O. completion will typically involve uh, setting a promise which will complete a uh, feature uh, somewhere. I'll show an example later. So essentially, CSTAR is an I.O. machine. It's just doing I.O. requests and processing I.O. completions. And nothing here, there are no locks we have to take, there are no atomic instructions we have to ex execute, so it's as efficient as it could, uh, as it could be. Um, so SEAL is not the only application written on top of CSTAR. We have our own memcached implementation. We also have an HTTPD implementation. These are uh, samples. There's someone doing a Redis implementation with a CSTAR with uh, very good results. Um, now here's um, an example of the Futures and Promises API. In this example, we have um, we're doing a read of a TCP connection. We're reading four bytes. That read exactly uh, function, what will, it will do is initiate the, um, the I.O., which in this case is attempting to read four bytes. This will schedule a task. And eventually, when the, the task becomes, when the um, I.O. completion becomes available, it will complete a promise. And that promise will trigger the future that read exactly returns. And when that happens, the continuation that we scheduled, which is that uh, then thing there, is going to run. So the way we program these APIs is as a set of continuations. Um, inside the first continuation, we were taking uh, the, those four bytes that we read, we are converting them into an int, and we're using that int to send a message to the core that is responsible for that data. Right? So we don't access that data directly. We send a message in a single producer, single consumer queue to the other core, who is going to eventually process that message, read the data, and give it back to us. And then finally, we have a continuation for that. When it's ready, we're just going to, again, asynchronously write the, re the reply in the connection. So this is how the code looks like in CLDV and in CISNR. It's all a set of uh, continuations. This is much, much more lightweight than, for example, the equivalent in Java and Scala. Uh, there we don't really have any control over which thread picks up what feature. So you still have to have uh, thread-safe data structures. You still have um, cache pollution. You don't have cache locality. Um, and there's a lot of overhead in the JVM task scheduler because it needs to be thread-safe, something that we, we don't need. Uh, also here, we, we can take advantage of stack allocations. We don't have to allocate on the heap uh, all of these features. So. There is much more in CSTAR than just this. Then there will be a, di a different talk. Um, now turning back to CLADB, we not only have our own task scheduler, we have our own I.O. scheduler. So typically in a normal application, you just send a lot of I.O. requests to the, to the kernel. And what will happen is that these requests will be queued either in the, the disk's uh, hardware queues, or they'll be queued in the device block layer, or they'll be queued in the file system. However, we prefer them to be queued in user mode. And why does it matter where the request is, is queued? Well, it matters because if we queue it in user space, we have uh, precise control over when to schedule a particular I.O. request. We can have different types of classes for different types of requests. So if there are a lot of uh, user rights 
and a bunch of compaction requests, we can decide what to prioritize. Not, not only that, but we can expose a lot, a lot of metrics, tell the user what, what um, process is queuing up all these requests. And finally, we can, for example, cancel a request before it has a chance to have an impact on the, on the lower layers. So this is another view of, of the scheduler. Here, the, um, we're saying that the disk can handle at most eight concurrent requests. And now we have um, different computing loads. We have uh, user rights, user requests, and we have internal loads such as uh, repair or compaction. And to each of those loads, we can assign a priority. And now all the scheduler needs to do is some sort of way to the round robin to execute these requests according to their priority. Um, we have an exponential decay algorithm that also ensures that if, there are no, if a class has no competition, then it can just take all the shares for itself and fully utilize the disk if needed. Um, here we could we have used the Linux I/O scheduler for this? Um, no, we typically disable the Linux I/O scheduler, and we do that because the only way you have to communicate priority to the Linux scheduler is by the calling thread. But here we have the same thread doing all of these requests. So the same thread issues requests for compaction, for user rights, and for repair. So there's no way to prioritize requests. Uh, and also the Linux I.O. scheduler tries to merge and reorder requests. And this is bad because if it reorders the request, then the one we decided was more prior had more priority won't actually have it. And if it merges requests, it means now that the first request will have the latency of the second request because they will be executed together. And that's setting latency, something we also do not want. Um, and this is the I.O. scheduler for storage. Even we're working on a CPU scheduler, and eventually we'll have a, a network scheduler as well. Uh, now, how do we know that the disk can only handle eight concurrent requests? Well, when you install Scylla, it, uh, the system will benchmark disks. It will throw loads at the disks with increasing concurrency. And we can see that at the beginning, when we increase concurrency, the throughput increases up until a plateau. And from then, if we keep increasing the concurrency, we see that the throughput doesn't increase. It's a plateau. What does increase linearly is the latency. So there is a particular sweet spot that, which is the number of requests that you want to concurrently send to, to a disk. And this is what we configure the I.O. scheduler with. So it, it's good to be able to execute I.O. fast and precisely, but it's uh, better not to have to do any I.O. at all. And for that end, Cassandra and Scylla both have um, caches. Cassandra in particular uses the Linux page cache. This has a set of drawbacks. Um, for instance, the granularity is 4K. Um, it is a thread safe uh, cache. Again, we'd be paying for something we don't, don't really need. Um, all the APIs are synchronous. So there is no way to interact with the cache asynchronously. Uh, its general purpose is optimized for server workloads, but it's also optimized for desktop machines, which means it's not optimized for anything. Um, then we have lack of control, both in the fact that the API is very limited. You can do read, write, and map, and advice, but it's not not doesn't give us enough control. And also, it's a different group of people have control over the source code. So we can't really change it to fit our, our needs. On the other hand, it is available. It has been worked on for many years um, by very smart people. And 
it handles a lot of edge cases that we'd otherwise have to handle and then do handle. So a particular problem with the 4K uh, granularity is that you get um, you get parasitic rows. A parasitic row means that if your data is only 300 bytes, then you're essentially bringing a lot of data into the cache that you don't really need and that you may never access. But worst of all, the fact that it's synchronous means that when you do a read from uh, the page cache, something that's not cached, you're going to be hit with a page fault. This means that the kernel will suspend the running thread and will uh, make an I.O. request to the disk. And only when it's ready will it reschedule uh, your thread. So this is unacceptable if all you have is one thread per core. Um, but Cassandra has additional caches in user mode. It has a key cache and a row cache, and it has on and off heap versions of each of these caches. This means that you have to tune them all. You have to specify exactly which size each cache has, which is practically impossible to get right. And if you do, you have to invest a lot of work in this. So everything Scylla has is a unified cache. And it essentially behaves similarly to the Cassandra's row cache. And it works in tandem with the Sistar memory allocator. Um, now I have to go back. and talk about the Sistar memory allocator. So we wrote our own memory allocator. And the reason for this is that you can really have uh, a good, um, good sharding if you rely on the system allocator, because you have no control over which memory it gives to you. So if it's running low on memory, it can give uh, a particular uh, shard, it can give memory that lives on another NUMA node. And aside from that, the system allocator is also thread safe. So you'd be paying a big penalty uh, in all those atomic instructions and synchronization primitives. So we have our own scheduler. Um, it gives, it allocates a four terabyte uh, virtual address, a uh, vir virtual um, block, and then it divides it into chunks and gives uh, some memory to each core. It's totally non-thread safe, but that's okay because it only gets accessed by one thread. Um, additionally, and this is a, another thing that the system scheduler can do, it gives uh, allocation back pressure. Uh, if, the memory al if the allocator is running low on memory, it can call a set of callbacks that can in turn uh, free some memory. And an example of this is the, the silly cache. So if the system is running low on memory, the Scylla cache will evict items and give back memory to the system. This is much like uh, the kernel works. If the kernel is running low on memory, it's going to swap things to disk. It's going to evict things from the page cache and eventually it will unleash the out of memory killer. Um, <clears throat> so going back. So we didn't write just one allocator. We wrote uh, another allocator in Scylla because there are still problems with um, malloc and free as an interface. And the main problem is memory fragmentation. So as your workload changes over time and your allocation sizes change over time, if uh, you're deallocating in a different order than you allocated in, you get fragmentation. Um, and if you have fragmentation, then if you want to start evicting things from cache and you have no control over the eviction order, and it, it, you may have to evict a lot of data before you can fit in um, a new and big request. So, in this example, we are allocating chunks of different sizes, and we keep going and going, 
until we eventually uh, run out of memory. So here, the allocator uh, will invoke the, um, the reclaimers, which will try to freeze some memory. And here again, since this is in Silas' case, it's tied to the cache, the freeing order will be uh, tied to the eviction policy. So we're evicting, we have to evict a lot of data until, until we finally have enough space to put the new block in. And we get that blank space there, which is not being used and may not be able to fit uh, a new request. So we have, we did a new allocator to try and, and address these problems. It works in a similar fashion as SS tables. Um, it's used mostly for the cache. And so there are, it's a very small set of allocation sites that you have to change uh, for, for a very big payoff. Um, the idea of this allocator is to uh, move objects around to prevent, to address fragmentation. So we have to teach the allocator how to move these objects around. Uh, for each type of object that is cached, we need to have a metadata object that tells the allocator how to move that object. So what back references to update. We have, we have um, for example, manage, managed bytes and managed vector for these um, data types that we usually put in, in the cache. Um, some people call this garbage collection, prefer the term compaction. Uh, but it's essentially the same thing. So the allocator works in with uh, 256k segments. It's bound to pointer allocation, just like in Java. Uh, you allocate in the current segment, um, and as you are freeing memory, you are leaving holes in these segments, as the picture earlier shows. Um, so when you don't have any memory to in the current segment to address a new allocation and you don't have any more segments, then you're going to try and re release a bunch of segments. And you start with the segment that has more holes in it. So you do the least amount of work to be able to satisfy the new allocation. Um, so every, this happens um, in the same thread as handling requests. But you still have to be careful with objects being moved from under you because if you read an object from cache and now let's say you want to serialize it over the network and you have to write it in chunks then each of these writes is asynchronous and for every chunk you don't want to have to look up the object in cache again so you want to keep a reference to the object a pointer to the object but if there's uh, a deferred point between the read of the object from cache and it's used in a later continuation, there's a possibility that in between some other task will cause uh, this allocator to move objects around. If it decides to move your object around, then the pointer that you had and that you're using in all of these continuations may no longer be valid. So we do need an, an API to, to pin an object and uh, tell the allocator that it can't move that one around. So um, with bump the pointer allocations, we get very fast allocations, and with compaction, we um, get less fragmentation, which le leads to better utilization of memory. Um, so finally, we tie everything together in what we call workload conditioning. This is uh, basically self-tuning the database. Um, they are internal feedback loops that try to balance competing loads. This is essentially having the database consume all the metrics that it exports. Right? Instead of just showing them in the dashboard, read them and try to adjust things. So if you have all of these competing loads, uh, the rise to the commit log, uh, mem table memory, uh, compaction, uh, user queries, 
and um, repairs, I want to be able to schedule them optimally to, to, to fully utilize all those resources the way you want. And you do this by having a set of controllers, right? You try and monitor the compaction backlog, backlog um, which tries to see how many SS tables there are, how many there should be. Um, are we compacting enough SS tables? Or are, are the reads uh, being affected, having uh, a very bad latency? And then we try to decide and do something about it. For example, we can increase the shares that uh, compaction has. We increase the shares, which means it can use more disk. If it's using more disk, then uh, user write requests are going to use less. And so we are throttling user requests, increasing uh, the shares of for compaction, eventually decreasing the compaction backlog enough so that reads are again at a, have again a good latency. And then we can revert this change and go back to the original priority. And the best thing is that the user doesn't have to do anything. The user doesn't have to control lots of knobs and most likely get it wrong. Um, the same is true for memory. So the memtails are, the, again, the updates that accumulate in memory. We call it dirty memory. And as we are up, um, accumulating these requests, we are also flushing some memtables to disk. We can't hold everything in memory, right? So this controller, what it does is monitor the rate at which these flushes are happening and compare them to the rate at which new user requests are coming. And the idea is that it can again adjust the priority, the shares that um, memtable flushing is getting. Maybe giving it more disk bandwidth and taking away from compaction but also maybe, maybe giving it more CPU uh, time and take it away from, for example, uh, repair. So it's a very simple idea, but uh, very hard to, to implement and, and get right. So with that, we come to some conclusions. So the first one is that uh, careful system design and full control of the software stack can have a big payoff. You can really maximize the throughput of your application. And you can do this without sacrificing latency. And most importantly, without requiring a lot of tuning from the users while having uh, a lot of fun. So this is how we can interact with, uh, with us. We're hiring, so if you want to join, have the link. Um, everything, I didn't say, but everything is open source. It's on, on GitHub, both uh, Scylla and Sistar. And we're on Twitter, have user groups. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? Questions, I guess? Yeah. So uh, I've got two questions, actually, if you don't mind. Um, the first one would be, so how production ready is this? I mean, you've rewritten essentially the Linux kernel somehow at a higher um, level or higher layer. So uh, how confident can we be to put that in production? It's, uh, you know, I mean. Pff. It's very production ready. Uh, it's as stable as Cassandra is, and we're closing the feature gap. We just merged counter support today, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, yeah, it's very much production ready. So the second question was in line of that. So, so are you like keeping up with the Cassandra APIs to yeah. provide 100% compatibility? Yeah. That's kind of a goal for your database? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in terms of features, we're only missing materialized views, which mm -hmm. we're working on, yeah. and uh, lightweight transactions. Then we'll have uh, parity for the most important features. We currently only support the 2.2 uh, SSable format, but we'll work on supporting the 3.0 format. Mm -hmm.
Thanks. Uh, uh, about the how to debug uh, this continuation uh, things, for example, if you don't, if you have continuation that depends on continuation, right. you don't have any stack you can uh, debug. No, say this this task has been called by this one and and so on. Uh, do you have a special tools to get track and debug easily that kind of things, or is it a problem or not in your experience? Or? You, sorry, you mean you mean this? Yeah, for example, if you have some problem in one part of the code, executing one task, uh, this task has been scheduled by your previous one, maybe. So uh, you don't have um, a stack trace of the calls. Right. So uh, so maybe it's difficult to get uh, yes. who, who invoked this task and who's it? I mean, uh, the, so this, this is a native application, so the stack traces are never um, as informative as they are mm -hmm. in Java. But the same problem you have in Java, right? When you have multiple features you don't, and you have continuations, you don't always get a clean stack trace. But what we do have is we have a set of GDB tools to help us debug this and follow a chain of continuations. Because they are li all linked through pointers, so you can have and retain some information. So, so you have developed your own yeah. tools for yeah, yeah. that sort of, of So we, we have addressed that because otherwise it would yeah, yeah. be hard. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. No, uh, I think they're in Scylla, Scylla GDB, I think. Uh, all the G GDB magic to work. So they but are the continuations and everything is part of CSR. So they are tools are really for more open source tools for using this or? Sorry? There are open source tools to debug this, or yeah, yeah. our own that, that, that we wrote, okay, we wrote okay. all of this. Okay, um, if you try to... Um, I see that you made an IO scheduler, and wondering if you try to also study uh, PC Express uh, SSD, because you see that you make a chain of eight channels, a request at a time, if you use PC Express uh, notable time memory, you can issue more, much more re uh, requests at the same time. Is it something that you look into, or uh, not yet? But it's something that that we want to look into. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think we're done. Huh? So this is a small question. If you go one slide before this one, I think the one with about with the yeah the one with the stacks. This. You have to learn about uh, no, it's how to handle that thing. Uh, Just sensitive. No, the one with the diagram with the thread stacks. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned that the, uh, in the case of CSR, the stacks are is just uh, an array of promises and tasks, right? But uh, I would guess that each of the tasks needs, needs its own uh, stack, or so no, uh, because they are going to make calls when they when no, they no. Run. So there, there are two things. Um, so one is a, a feature is and the continuation. That's just the lambda that you give it and the data that the lambda captures, right? And the lambda is the data that you capture and an instruction pointer. And that's the only thing that is very lightweight, right? So everything, if, if so it's, it's all on the stack. If you do a continuation on a feature that's already completed, if you run the continuation, nothing gets allocated on the heap. All the memories is well. That's another question because they will not execute in order. So how how do you keep them in the stack? No, in, sorry, I'll have to use this again. Here, if if for example, if the core is the current core, you're sending a message to yourself. You're not actually going to submit anything uh, to the reactor. So the feature that submit to returns will already be completed. Oh, I can see that this will execute in order, but you, you picture your... I know, in those cases it, it will have to be heap allocated. I'm just saying, okay. in the particular case where you schedule a continuation on an already completed feature, it's only stack. Now going back to your question, yeah, the, uh, a feature is just that. Uh, a task is just that. A continuation is just that. A function pointer to a lambda and data that the lambda captures. But we do have a green thread implementation, which does allocate a small bit of memory to work as a green thread stack. And we use uh, set jump and get jump to uh, schedule between green threads. And the green threads, which we call the CSR threads, 
are the only things that can actually block waiting for a feature. Right? We just schedule them out in user mode, and when the feature completes, schedule them back in. And those do have a, a little stack. Thanks. And just another question. Do you find yourselves uh, modifying and sending patches to, for C star while you develop on CLADB, or is it very uh, mature? Mm, no, we do, we do. Um, trying to think of an example. So, utilities is like utility functions that work on features. Uh, we just merged one, so have a when all continuation, when all when a set of features is ready, then run the continuation. We just added an overload that only runs uh, if they're all successful. Um, then we do have like um, uh, the lock structure allocator that I mentioned. It's in Scylla, but when the API stabilizes, eventually it will be moved into CSR. But then both things are very tied together because one Scylla is driving CSR. But CSR sees a lot of uh, external contributions. Thank you. Um, regarding the self um, kind of adjusting monitor yeah. uh, setup, so the, is there like an option, well, possibility of conflicting with each other, the monitors? I imagine that's the case, or you have like a static priorities um, between them, or what, what, what's, what's the setup in this case? So far, we haven't run into that case. Um, but yeah, eventually there will be some noise. And so you have to be resist resistant to that. You just can't make a change the first time you see it. So otherwise, if there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of back and forth. So yeah, that's something we take into account and work around it. It's, it's a lot of control theory and stuff, mm -hmm. but it works. Okay. Thank you. Cool, thanks. We're done, I guess. Thank you.